Great to everybody out here this morning. Uh, my name is R.J. Pastrito. I am the graduate dean at the college and a professor of politics. Uh, and I am chairing this panel on the future of the Democratic Party. Uh, we have three very distinguished panelists. Uh, I, I will, uh, each of them is gonna speak for no more than 15 minutes. And I'll introduce uh, each uh, speaker as uh, he's about to come up to the podium. And then following uh, the initial presentations, we'll have some discussion among the panelists and throw uh, things open to questions from the audience. Uh, we're going to begin with Douglas Schoen. Uh, Douglas Schoen has been uh, one of the most uh, well-known Democratic uh, campaign consultants for over 40 years. He was a founding partner and former principal strategist for the polling and consulting firm Penn, Schoen, and Berland. And he's also the founder and principal of Douglas E. Schoen LLC in New York City. Uh, his, political clients, his political clients have included former President Bill Clinton, uh, as well as former New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg. Uh, as you uh, probably know, he's a regular contributor to the Wall Street Journal, to the Washington Post, uh, various other newspaper and online publications, as well as Fox News. Uh, please join me in welcoming Douglas Schoen. Well, uh, first of all, Thank you for the kind introduction. I'm very pleased to be here. And uh, I think in answer to one of the questions that I frequently get, yes, I am still a Democrat, <laughs> barely. And I say that, um, and you know, one of the problems I have uh, doing this panel with two extraordinary minds, particularly uh, someone in Bill Galston, I say that, Andrew, particularly because he frequently writes in the journal what I'm thinking before I've even had a chance to crystallize my thoughts. And uh, so, Bill, if I plagiarize you or an otherwise take uh, uh, a bit of your thunder, I would, uh, uh, would apologize. But I, I grew up in an era where the two parties were relatively close, uh, that there were moderate Republicans and conservative Democrats. I count myself now as a moderate to conservative Democrat, more in the, uh, I'd say, Scoop Jackson, uh, uh, Hubert Humphrey uh, mold. Uh, the very few of us left, I wrote down in my notes, a dinosaur. And while I hope that's an exaggeration, since I see none of you laughing, I realize it's not too much uh, of, of, a, uh, of an exaggeration. Um, we live in a world now that I find, as a Democrat, and I dare say, as an American, deeply distressing and deeply disorienting. Because no matter what your view is of um, policy outcomes, we are all Americans. We have American interests, and we have, an, in my judgment, an overarching need to pursue them as Americans, not as conservatives, not as moderates, not as liberals, but as Americans. Uh, you hear that occasionally, less so than you used to, but the number of people who really believe that is precious few. Uh, and as a democratic centrist who is hawkish on foreign policy, I find myself a very, very lonely man. Um, I also find myself lonely in another area, and again, Bill, I, I apologize. Have, Bill's written a column on what I'm about to say, and so I don't mean to be too impertinent, but, uh, and I'll put it in the form of a question. Uh, how many of you have heard Democrats this year on the campaign trail of any ideological strike talking about job creation, growing the economy, uh, preparing people, for technological jobs or jobs that may exist. I, I haven't heard it. And it startles me because when you look at the polling data, uh, if the economy is not number one, it's certainly number two or three. And if we get any sort of downturn uh, into the 2020 election, it is absolutely the case that the economy will be front and center, uh, the top issue. 
to my way of thinking, in the absence of any discussion of growth and job creation, we focus to a degree that I find almost unimaginable on redistribution of wealth. The comprehensive set of policies uh, from increasing taxes on the wealthy, wealth taxes, increasing uh, inheritance taxes, to me offers a very clear and compelling narrative of what the Democratic Party has come to stand for. And every new policy that gets articulated, if there is a huge price tag associated with it, such as the Green New Deal, uh, you hear, well, the wealthy should pay more. I, I dare say that that is neither an economic strategy, nor is it a strategy on climate change, nor is it something that, in my mind, is reasonable and uh, responsible at all. The other thing that's not reasonable and responsible to me is where we stand with the federal debt and deficit. And as one of those in the mid-90s who pushed Bill Clinton very hard to do a balanced budget, to reduce the debt and deficit, to compromise with Newt Gingrich, and I believe, if I'm right, Bill, left the country with a small surplus when the Clinton administration was over, I am appalled that we have a uh, uh, deficit now that is in the trillions of dollars. And there is nobody, I mean, and if there is somebody and I missed it, I apologize, but I don't hear anyone of any real significance talking about that or the implications of that for social programs. Indeed, we tried in the 90s to have a dialogue about Social Security, entitlement programs, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security in a way to preserve and protect them for the future. Um, Paul Ryan tried in what I thought was a somewhat ham-handed way. Obviously, it didn't work so well. Uh, he's now seeking other employment. But uh, that being said, I, I would think a responsible political party would want to talk about entitlements, the budget, and our future, and again, my party says nothing about that. Rather, the emphasis is on redistribution and something else that I find uh, equally disarming dis and disturbing, which is this sectarian conflict between the left and what's left of the moderate wing of the party. And the fact that we are engaging uh, both on the presidential level and indeed in terms of primaries with the so-called Justice Democrats and the squad in this uh, fratricidal process will only serve to make more challenging for the Democrats the um, difficulty uh, in ultimately uh, prevailing at the presidential or congressional le level in 2020. Um, the question you would obviously ask, and of course, uh, given that I'm here, I would have to answer, is, well, what's going to happen in the nominating process? Uh, Mr. Schoen, you uh, presumably have been close to it. I did work for Mayor Bloomberg uh, last, uh, I guess, last year and early this year when he made a determination that he would not seek the presidency, uh, and I certainly understand why he said that he did not see, with Joe Biden running, room for two moderates, because uh, the nature of the party has changed to the point where the, both the energy and the enthusiasm, as we saw in the new Wall Street Journal NBC poll, is with the left, and the size of the of the number of voters who will vote for a left-wing candidate appears from what I can see looking at that poll today and looking at the poll that Bill put in his column in the journal today to be somewhere 40, 50 percent of the primary electorate. So, okay, given all that, um, where do we stand? The, that 
uh, poll, the, the NBC Wall Street Journal poll, has a gap of five points between Biden and Warren. Um, that, to me, uh, spells dire, dire problems for Joe Biden, whose challenges on the campaign trail are well known, seen, and certainly something either others will discuss, or we could discuss among ourselves or with the audience. But certainly Biden doesn't have what you'd call growth potential. Uh, Warren clearly does. I don't know how many of you have followed what she said, but it is as anti-capitalist as you would ever uh, want to imagine. Now, she says she's a capitalist, but says when insurance companies charge high premiums and have the temerity to try to minimize their payouts, that there's something fundamentally wrong with that process. I, uh, can understand why she might want to alter the health system, but the idea of using a presidential election to uh, effectively eviscerate our traditional notions of capitalism and free markets does not sound like, again, the Democratic Party that uh, I joined uh, as a very young man when I was moved to uh, involvement by John F. Kennedy, and I site for those of you old enough to remember. I think it was a tax cut, and it was, I think it was 63, and Kennedy saying rising tides lift all, uh, lift all boats or something like that. Certainly this is a very, very different party now. But I think given the tightness of the polling that Bill cited this morning in New Hampshire, I think uh, what we've seen in Iowa with Warren within a couple of points of Biden, I think Warren, given her the enthusiasm she's generating, uh, 20,000 people in Washington Square Park, um, uh, I guess two days ago, I think she's become the favorite for the nomination. And if you've noticed what Donald Trump has done, uh, he's been attacking Biden uh, with his campaign videos for his gaffes. He's largely left uh, Senator Warren alone. Uh, and I think his hope is to run against her, to run against the far-left Democratic Party, and to make Warren, the squad, and the left effectively interchangeable. Um, do I think it's likely to be effective? Well, let's put it this way. Trump is in a position where he is eminently beatable. His numbers are terrible, the way he conducts himself, uh, whether you agree with him or not, is really not what the American people want their president to do. He flip-flops. His approval rating is now in the low 40s. Some polls have had it in the high 30s. He should be somebody who is easy to beat. Um, but I don't believe that's going to be the case. I think Warren will be a tough, tough general election candidate uh, for the electorate to deal with, particularly swing voters in the Midwest. And if I had to bet, I'd bet on an, a, a close election with uh, Donald Trump having an advantage, despite all the liabilities and political problems that uh, he now has. Look, if we face a recession uh, of the type we saw in 2008, all bets are off, and we might be looking at a Warren um, Sanders administration. But barring, uh, that was also a joke. Um, <laughs> Uh, I don't think she'd run with Sanders, but uh, again, the absence of any reaction tells you what you think and I think of where the Democratic Party is. So I'll stop on that note and leave it to my colleagues to perhaps offer a more informed and thoughtful presentation than I have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker uh, will be William A. Galston, whom uh, many of you will, will recognize from his uh, weekly column uh, that he writes for the Wall Street Journal. Uh, he also holds the uh, Ezra Zilka Chair in the Brookings Institution's Governance Studies Program. Uh, that's where he serves as a senior fellow. And prior to uh, January of 2006, he was the Saul Stern Professor and Acting Dean at the School of Public Policy at the University of Maryland. 
Uh, and I should add that uh, Dr. Galston was also the deputy assistant to President Clinton for domestic policy from 1993 to 1995. Uh, please join me in welcoming him. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for coming out early in the morning to listen to these reflections on the future of the Democratic Party. Uh, just a few comments on what we've just heard. As a partially defrocked academic, I have always viewed plagiarism as the sincerest form of flattery, and I, <laughs> <laughs> I am duly flattered. Um, you know, as for uh, you know, you know, as for budget. Uh, as for budget deficits, uh, President Clinton delivered four years of surpluses in a row, four consecutive surpluses, to the extent that the former Fed chair, Alan Greenspan, was wringing his hands about the possibility that the debt would be paid down and eliminated, making it very much more difficult for uh, the global financial system uh, to make use of U.S. debt as a safe harbor. That was $22 trillion ago. Uh, I should also say that uh, I was at a small event with Senator Michael Bennett last night, who was also running for president, and you would have heard everything you wanted to hear about economic growth and educational opportunity. If I, remember. I understand. Uh, uh, so does he. Yep. Uh, he, also under, he also understands that Senator Gary Hart was at 1% at a comparable point in 1983. So uh, it's, you know, uh, uh, but this is, this being a Hillsdale audience, I will recur to first principles. Uh, you know, as you all know, uh, the US Constitution makes no explicit provision for political parties. You also know that the founders did not anticipate the development of a party system, and they certainly did not want one. But within just a few years after the inauguration of the Constitution and the beginning of our constitutional order, we had, in effect, a two-party system. And with some bumps in the road and occasional detours, we've had a two-party system ever since. The two-party system appears to be our constitutional fate. Is this bad news? Uh, I think not, because it turns out that in an increasingly you know, large and diverse country, political parties turn out to be essential ways of organizing arguments about the future of the country. And that is the ultimate justification of our party system. Or more precisely, to propose responses to the major problems facing our country within the framework of defensible interpretations of our constitutional order. Now, this role for the parties involves, in part, uh, debatable specifications of what these problems are. Uh, sometimes the parties agree on what the problems are and only disagree about responses or solutions. Uh, today, as sometimes happens, there is disagreement between the parties both about the most important problems facing the country and the nature of the solutions to be offered. Nonetheless, uh, let me, you know, I have come neither to bury the Democratic Party nor to praise it, but to analyze the current situation facing the party and the country. So let me, let me offer a list of what I think most people are, would agree are problems uh, confronting the country. Uh, first, you know, the economic and social consequences of the profound economic transformation that we have been undergoing for decades and continue to undergo with a constant wave of technological, technological innovation. Uh, second, the implications <clears throat> of increasing demographic diversity, which is baked into our population 
even if we slam the doors entirely shut on immigration tomorrow. Uh, what are the implications of this demographic diversity for public policy and also for social cohesion? Uh, the clash, which I think is quite a systematic clash between what I'll call uh, traditional and progressive cultural outlooks, uh, shifting gears, the economic and military implications of China's rise for America's role in the world, uh, authoritarian challenges to the post-war hegemony of liberal democracy, and finally, and I would add on a constitutional note, the implications of the hollowing out of Congress and the shift of power both to the executive branch and to the judiciary. Now, because our large and diverse country has only two major parties, thanks to our first past the post system, each party of necessity is a coalition with internal differences and also fissures. Within today's Democratic Party, uh, there are disagreements about the best responses uh, to the challenges that I've enumerated. Uh, and because of that, it is the parties, caucuses, and primaries will, that will determine the agenda that the Democratic Party presents to the country as an alternative to a Republican Party, which is now dominated as rarely before by the figure and the orientation of the Republican president. president. Uh, so simply put, the present of the Democratic Party is an argument about the future of the Democratic Party. And what's going on in, the in this primary season may be disorderly, but it is not trivial. Uh, because it is an argument about the future of one of the two great and enduring political parties in this country. Now, what is the argument about within the Republican Party, within the Democratic Party? Well, in part, it's an argument about economics. Uh, how much and what kind of government intervention is needed to rectify the imbalances that have de developed in different sectors of the economy and I would argue among different regions of the country. And this re these regional divisions are real and consequential and worrying. So what is the right balance of market-based mechanisms and command and control measures? To what extent is the increasing concentration of ownership among fewer and fewer businesses in many sectors of the economy a problem for growth and innovation? a problem that the antitrust division of the Justice Department in the Trump administration is now wrestling with. Uh, can a partnership with corporate America be consistent with the objective of economic growth that benefits all classes and regions, or should the Democratic Party treat corporate America as a foe that must be brought to heel? Uh, there are, many other, there are many other divisions uh, within the party on immigration, uh, on health care. Is it Obamacare, Obamacare plus a public option, Medicare for all? Uh, what should we do with our troops in Afghanistan, the so-called endless war? Uh, should they be pulled out unconditionally? Should we demand tougher conditions than Zal, than Zal Khalilzad has so far? Uh, should we leave them there indefinitely? Uh, what about the Trans-Pacific Partnership? Uh, I think it's fair to say that Senator Elizabeth Warren would like to get to no on the TPP, and former Vice President Biden would like to get to yes. Uh, what about the size of the defense budget? Uh, some Democratic candidates believe that the defense budget is about right-sized, and others think it's much too big. Uh, how much of an enemy is China? Are we facing a new Cold War, or does China present us with a mix of competition and cooperation? 
There's also political disagreement. Uh, does President Trump represent an historical detour, as Joe Biden would have it, or an historical discontinuity, as many other Democrats believe? And in parallel with that, uh, is the task of the Democratic Party to get the country back to normal, which is more or less the Biden position, whatever you think normal is, or is it radical structural change, which is the, def which is the basic position of the left wing of the Democratic Party? What's going to happen? Uh, I don't know. I genuinely don't know. Uh, if things continue as they're now going, we are looking, in effect, structurally speaking, at a rerun of the 2016 primary between Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders, although the figures representing those two different forces in the party are, are different. Uh, you know, I agree that at this point, the force appears to be with uh, Senator Warren. On the other hand, uh, her, uh, her appeal is to a relatively small slice of the overall demography of the Democratic Party. Uh, and the African-American vote is key after the early primaries and caucuses. And there, Joe Biden has fully 50% support, and he doesn't seem to be losing it. So I think it's a fair fight. Uh, there's no way of predicting the outcome for sure. But I can say this. Uh, history is a series of sequential, consequential contingencies each one shaping the range of possibilities for the next. It is inevitable that the debate in today's Democratic Party will be shaped in part by the powerful figure of Donald Trump and what he represents. Uh, and the Democratic Party is wrestling with the question of the best argument to make what President Trump against what President Trump represents, given the fact that some of what he represents overlaps with at least some of what the Democratic Party believes. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Our uh, third speaker this morning will be Andrew Sullivan, who is a contributing editor at New York magazine uh, and is also a blogger and an author. Uh, he was the New Republic's youngest editor-in-chief and he also worked for Time uh, for the New York Times magazine and served as a senior editor for The Atlantic. He joined uh, New York magazine as a contributing editor in 2016 where he covers politics and culture uh, and occasionally writes features. Uh, he also has two new books uh, one is titled Keeping the Faith, which is a spiritual memoir about the future and meaning of Christianity in the 21st century. And he has a 30-year retrospective of essays and reviews titled Thinking Out Loud. Uh, please join me in welcoming Andrew Sullivan. Thank you very much. Um, just to clear up a small, small point of fact, the last two books that my that you cited have not yet been written. <laughs> uh, they've been put on hold until the Trump period is concluded in some way or other. Um, I just, for the record, I'm not a Democrat, never have been, but neither have I ever been a Republican. The only thing I've ever been really is a Tory. Uh, and, Wet or dry? Uh, I was very sort of um, uh, on the rocks, let's put it that way. Uh, uh, so just a few thoughts about what has been said and what, what we're talking about. For, I think this is an incredibly fertile moment for the left. Uh, I think for a couple of obvious reasons, and you see this not just here but in Europe as well. And the first is that clearly uh, market capitalism is failing most people in the West. Uh, the ability to actually raise most people's standard of living, to afford a house, to afford college, all the core things 
that people want to make themselves a better life. I have someone whispering uh, in my ear here. Uh, okay. Um, uh, where was I? Um, market capitalism is failing, um, clearly failing. And this is creating a huge demand, especially among the younger generations, for radical reform. If you look at the next two generations' views on the core issues of old issues of right and left, they are further left than in any time uh, since the 30s. Uh, they don't like capitalism for the first time, really. A generation of Americans do not like it. And you can see, and the same also in, in the United Kingdom, which I know a little bit about, you can see that's also the case in, in the UK. How to fix this? How to fix the fact that everybody's working harder than ever and only a tiny proportion of people are benefiting massively? That's the question that people are asking. And secondly, I think the other issue that is propelling the left is the climate crisis. Uh, that as the world hurtles towards unprecedented uh, climate turbulence and mass migration as a consequence, uh, obviously government has a role to play in preventing such a catastrophe from unfolding. And most people, especially those again under 40, who will have to live in that world, want change, big change, in order to prevent that happening. So it is, in my view, a really fertile time. A program for redistribution of wealth has enormous potential as a vote winner, whether you agree with it or not. Uh, radical efforts to prevent climate change are increasingly popular. And it should be, I think, a walkover. Why it isn't a walkover, why in fact the Democrats and the left in general are struggling is, is very interesting. See, in the last general election in the United Kingdom, the Labour Party, led by Jeremy Corbyn, the most far left individual in the history of British politics, let alone as prime minister, uh, once he laid out his manifesto at the beginning of the campaign, which is basically massive redistribution, uh, building of houses, uh, and, and an over, over, overhauling of, of market capitalism in the United Kingdom, he gained 20 points. The campaign, that is why the Tories are in such problem, because the Labour Party's message of redistribution is actually increasingly popular. I think there are two reasons this is not working for the left. And the first is immigration. That people are prepared, I think, to move to the left quite radically on economics. But unless they're reassured in this very turbulent time that their countries aren't simply open borders to anybody who wants to come there, they're not going to get a hearing. The Democrats' position on immigration is now so far to the left, so far towards open borders, uh, that it disqualifies them in the minds of many other people who still believe that there is such a thing as a nation state, there are such things as borders, and the Democratic Party seems to be completely oblivious of this. And the second reason is intersectionality. It is the shift within the left away from the economic Marxism to a cultural Marxism, uh, in which the various groups, I don't need to explain this at Hillsdale, uh, individuals are characterized by their membership in certain oppressed groups. Society is understood entirely as a matter of power, not freedom. And the only thing to do is to resist those in power on behalf of those out of it. And seeing that as the core reality of humanity, divided by race, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, and these themes are being used and spread throughout the educational system, including the elementary school system now, as a way to transform society in the most radical lines, to abolish nature, to abolish the difference between men and women, uh, to insist that all differences in outcome 
in almost any line of work or area of expertise is entirely due to forms of oppression and nothing else. This ideology, of course, is now the orthodoxy being taught across American education. It is the orthodoxy being taught every day, deliberately, by the New York Times. It is not something that most regular, normal Americans believe in. They still believe in the ideas of opportunity, meritocracy. They just want to be able to succeed and know that in this particular economy, the chances of their succeeding is extremely small. In the process of the elites of the Democratic Party on the left moving drastically to the left, and indeed moving towards open borders more explicitly, is a function also of Donald Trump. That Trump's genius, if you want to call it that, is to so polarize the country, to advocate such extraordinary uh, measures on the far right that the far left has been emboldened by this. And the liberals in the Democratic Party uh, have to say, yes, we know we're up against this figure. Yes, we know he's doing all these things that we despise. But let's be sensible and let's be moderate. Let's not take the bait. Let's not go crazy. Let's not just oppose him in every single respect to the extreme. That's a very, very difficult case to make in the mood right now on the left and the right. So my view, for what it's worth, and all this is made incredibly worse and has been created in part by social media, which means the elites are really talking to themselves and have no understanding of what's happening outside. That's why they could have nominated Hillary Clinton, uh, an insane act, uh, given her popularity and her credibility, and now they've decided that they want Hillary 2.0, but not quite as charming. But they cannot help themselves. And the liberal tradition, liberalism itself, has collapsed. You see this also across Europe. Center-left parties have completely imploded. And the Labour Party in Britain, the biggest and most successful one recently, has only survived because the far left has taken the whole thing over. So I think, short term, we're going to have major polarization. And the Democratic Party, if they nominate Warren, will lose. That's what I suspect. Of course, anything can happen. Uh, but I also think that if we continue with what we have in power and we have no reforms in the economy, then that will be a very short-term victory for the right. And that what's coming is a landslide for the very far left. It'll come when it comes is simply a matter of time. And whether the Democratic Party can marshal that energy to win elections uh, is, is the real question. They're, they're the most useless political party in the West, and they can screw it up. Uh, but the tide is with them. Thank you. Okay, thanks to all our panelists for those uh, presentations. I want to give uh, them some opportunity to respond to uh, one another. Would anyone uh, like to begin that? Uh, I'll, I'll begin. Please. And if you could, rem I think the microphones at your oh, seat sure. are working, and, sure. and uh, I'll kind of referee it from up here if I can. Uh, Bill, how would you respond to Andrew's presentation? Is there an emerging Democratic majority that's just 10 or 15 years away or sooner? Is this on? It is. It is on, yes. Uh, I guess Andrew has a much clearer crystal ball than I do. Uh, if I wanted to be contentious, you know, I would say that the Tories in the UK are giving the Democrats a pretty good run for their money for, for uselessness, uh, but, uh, but let's not go there. Uh, we can. The, the, the election's coming up. <laughs> uh, oh, yes. Uh, I, I don't share the view uh, that the Democratic Party
Party has capitulated to far-left forces. Uh, the nomination of Hillary Clinton uh, was, you know, was labeled an insane act. Would it have been saner to nominate Bernie Sanders, who was the only available alternative? I don't think so. Uh, and as, you know, as I read, for example, the Democratic primary electorate in New Hampshire, uh, just in today's Wall Street Journal, I published a piece about the views of that electorate. Uh, they are not in favor of revolution. They're, they are in favor of reform. Uh, they would like that reform to draw on the best ideas and energy from both political parties. Uh, and I think that the view of the Democratic Party that you see, if you look at it through the prism of campus leftism, is really a crazy, mini, uh, crazy mi mirror caricature of the actual rank and file of the party. Uh, no doubt the Democratic Party of today is nothing like the Democratic Party of 1960, but I hasten to add that the Republican Party of today is nothing like the Republican Party of 1960 either. Uh, both have changed. Neither has changed in a direction that I particularly like, uh, but uh, I think perhaps it's my role on this panel uh, to be a defender of the Democratic Party because no one else in this panel seems to want to occupy that role. Uh, <laughs> but Bill, you were defending a Democratic Party in New Hampshire that included, I think if I have it right, 30 to 40 percent uh, independents of that group, as I remember your article, 30 percent voted for Donald Trump. So That's correct. The, the group you were describing is not really the Democratic electorate as I know it or as Andrew tried to describe it, right? Wrong. No, uh, the, isn't wrong. Uh, <laughs> clearly right. Well, well, let me suggest. Let me suggest a uh, compromise, which is me, that, in fact, Bill, you most regular Democratic voters are not far left at all. It's irrelevant. Uh, the activist base is selecting far left candidates to pick from, with the exception of Biden, who is clearly too old to do what he's doing. Uh, and it's those elites that are determining the policy. And I see absolutely no one, for example, uh, among any of the Democratic candidates that's pushed back the slightest bit on the question, say, of immigration or of the social justice uh, agenda. In fact, they've all completely capitulated to it. I don't agree with that either. Uh, for, example, for example, Biden was not the only Democrat who pushed back against the proposition that unauthorized border crossing should be decriminalized. Not the only one by far. Uh, it who, el who else? Uh, who else? Because uh, I think they all put up their hands. Bennett, no. Uh, I believe Senator Globuchar from Minnesota did not accept that proposition and a couple of others. It divided the party. And many of the people who put up their hands I think we'll have cause to regret it if they're not already regretting it. I would say one other thing, that if you have lots and lots of people fighting for half of the party and only one or two people fighting for the other half of the party, there's a certain tactical advantage to the less densely populated field. Uh, and you know, Senator Sanders is not fading nearly fast enough for the Warren forces uh, and as long as he stays in the race and gets above the 15% threshold, he is going to have a very hard time commanding a majority within the Democratic Party. So I guess I just have, I have a very different view of what's going on. Uh, and I do not agree with the proposition that the elites are driving the entirety of the debate within the Democratic Party. Maybe I'll put one uh, one question to the panel before we we open it up. And uh, I haven't heard uh, the issue of gun control uh, raised uh, yet this morning, but it's certainly very much on uh, the, the current public policy agenda. 
Uh, and I wonder, especially as important as that is uh, to some of the electoral battles that uh, you're all speaking to, if you might say something about, about the party and the, and the gun control issue. Well, I'll be happy to. First of all, you know, first of all, the Second Amendment is in the Constitution, and as interpreted by the Supreme Court in the Heller, in the Heller decision, it's the law of the land. And so the question is, what is permissible within the Constitution as interpreted by the Supreme Court? And of those things that are permissible, what is good public policy? Uh, and do democratic proposals uh, map onto those contours comfortably? I would say this. Every single survey that I've seen shows between 85 and 90 percent public support for universal background checks. Every single one. A majority of Democrats, Republicans, Independents, and NRA members are all in favor of that. Uh, and I believe that, uh, I, uh, you know, I believe that the, the support for that proposition is strong enough so that a candidate who takes the other side of that position is going to have a problem. Uh, do, I th do I think that the involuntary confiscation of classes of weapons is either constitutional or politically prudent? No, I don't. But there is a lot of daylight between the involuntary confiscation of classes of weapons on the one hand and the status quo on the other and it's the task of reasonable people in both political parties to find that sweet spot. Let me try to put that in the context of campaigning. And I'm going to try to talk in plain English. You will win a Democratic primary taking as strong a position on gun control as you feel prudent. There is a sense, and I think rightly, of uh, the moral urgency of background checks uh, out of a universal nature, red flag laws, lie and try. And yes, uh, there is 65, 70 percent support in the Democratic primary for um, uh, an assault weapon ban. So you're predicting the nomination of Beto O'Rourke, is that correct? <laughs> I think I made very clear that that is not what I'm predicting. <laughs> and I do think you heard me. Anyway, um, but what I would say to Bill's point is the Republicans and their leader, Mitch McConnell, has basically said, I'm not doing anything unless the president's going to sign it. And as we sit here today, it doesn't look to me like anything's going to get done. We might. And Bill could be right on this. The overwhelming power of the background check issue could be one that gets through the Senate and the House. But despite the numbers that Bill cites, which are absolutely correct, Mitch McConnell has been unfailingly resistant. Uh, and the real change is in the 2018 midterms. I was working for Mike Bloomberg's PAC IUSA. We used the gun issue. We used it unabashedly and without any apology, but of course supporting Second Amendment. And we had breakthroughs in 21 of the 25 districts we campaigned in, and in none of those districts was support for gun control anything but a political positive. So I think the Republicans are behind the curve on the issue, but I do also think that the strength of a very weakened, and I dare say uh, allegedly corrupt NRA, is such that the other side of the issue has been weakened. Uh, what I will say is one of probably the few people here who has debated the issue extensively against the right is the argument against gun control uh, of the type that Bill is describing, or I am uh, either both advocating and describing, is you're taking our guns away. And as specious as I think that claim is, if you're just talking about background checks, until recently, that claim and the fervor that the right attaches to it has been surprisingly effective. 
as I said, 2018, much less effective, and it is, in my mind, an open question how the issue will play out in 2020. But if the Republicans don't embrace some sort of compromise on getting rid of the loopholes on background checks, I think it'll be a huge potential Democratic issue in the general election. Okay, I think with that, uh, we will go to uh, questions from the audience. There are uh, some uh, folks with microphones, uh, and so uh, if you could raise your hands and they will uh, come to you and, and let you use those to address a question to the panel. Uh, I see several hands over there. I'll let you guys just figure that out. Please, sir. Uh, my question involves whether the other two gentlemen agree or disagree with Mr. Sullivan on that capitalism has been an unabashed failure in the Western nations. I don't feel that, I feel that the younger generation has had great difficulties because of the increase in college tuition and some of those aspects. But to call it an unabashed failure in the West astounds me. Well, can I just respond to that? Uh, obviously, capitalism has been an incredible success if you look at the, the entire world, and it's certainly been a success in the last 20 years for large numbers of people in the developing world. Uh, it is not working for middle class and working class Westerners. It is actually making it incredibly hard uh, for them to scrape together a living. Uh, the, the data is simply unanswerable. Um, it's the idea that a capitalist economy will benefit everyone has disappeared because it is not true anymore. Uh, and I think uh, people on the right need to get, get real about that. That's why we have Trump. That's why we have a, a, a rejection of uh, what you might call neoliberalism, because in the end, it was a victim of its own success. And the forces of mass migration uh, and of globalization and of free trade have, have essentially decimated the potential for ordinary people in the West to actually earn a living and to see the living standards of their kids be higher than their own. And right now, the living standards are gonna be lower. And that is not a success, I'm sorry. It's not a success in the last, we're talking about this particular period in time and it's really hurting. That's why our entire politics are the way they are. I, I, to me, the, it, the answer that Andrew just gave now as opposed to his earlier answer is very close to my own view. Look, if you look at the numbers that Donald Trump cites in each of his speeches, it's hard to disagree with his reports about lowest unemployment rate, highest levels of employment for minorities, and it's hard to look at those numbers and say that we have been anything but successful. And you look at the poll data, his rating on handling the economy is about 10 points, 12 points higher than his overall approval rating. But it, Andrew's right, it would be absolutely uh, wrong to conclude from those numbers that uh, we've had the level of upward mobility and reduction in income inequality that a healthy society sees. To me, the reason I talk about uh, jobs in my initial presentation is the Democrats need a narrative that is both pro-capitalism, pro-growth. I think it's what Bill, if, if I can flatter him again with plagiarism, uh, called inclusive growth. And I think if the Democrats are able to do that as part of an overarching strategy that doesn't necessarily focus exclusively on culture, they will be inestimably stronger in November 2020. <clears throat> My view is that if you look at the history of market economies extending back hundreds of years, uh, they go through period periodic uh, episodes of crisis or deep challenge. And the task in each case, and it has been successful up to now, is to make the necessary policy adjustments 
uh, in the framework of market economies uh, so that they do achieve their objectives, including widespread benefits to the populations, not just developing countries, but of developed countries. Uh, I believe that in the wake of the economic crisis of 2008 and 2009, uh, we are again in one of those periods. The argument within the Democratic Party is whether capitalism should be adjusted or abandoned. I confidently predict at the end of the day that the market economy in the United States will be adjusted, not abandoned. There will be responses to a series of particular challenges, including the cost of health care, the, 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 the cost of higher education, uh, the fact that many young people today, even in their 30s, view the prospect of home ownership as almost unimaginably distant, which is a profound transformation from the way, thing, way things were. In other words, we're not in the 1990s anymore. Uh, and the optimism that we had uh, about having a winning hand and needing only to play it out reasonably skillfully has dissipated, I think, for good reasons. Uh, and we now have to think more deeply about the adjustments to the market economy that are, that are necessary. Many Republican thinkers, for example, are talking about systems of tax credits or wage supplements for low and moderate income workers. Not to put too fine a point on that, that is a form of redistribution within, within the market system. Many Democrats agree with that approach. I would also say in conclusion that the government every year publishes a comprehensive report on income and poverty. And the report that came out just last week showed that corrected for inflation, the median earnings of men working full-time year-round have not increased since 1973. Those are, those are official government. That, that is a failure, right? That is a failure of capital. That is, you know, that is I would say, uh, evidence, evidence at the very least that something has gone wrong that needs to be fixed. Whether socialism is the name of the fix, I am very skeptical. Me too, Bill. I'm not advocating. I'm just trying to analyze what's yeah, me going too. on. Um, me too. Uh, uh, I, would vote, I would support Joe Biden over, over that. But I'm just trying to explain why I think the forces that have, that have, that have swept over people, mm -hmm. which they're responding to by very understandably wanting to curtail free trade, wanting to curtail immigration, wanting to, to make themselves feel more secure in this, in this, uh, in this economy, uh, ha is, is one of the central issues of our time. It's, it's, it's defining all of our politics. And, and again, I think if it weren't for immigration and if it weren't for their uh, cultural Marxism, Dems could do really well and adjust capitalism just in a more uh, redistributive, redistributive way. Well, I think, you know, I I think we largely agree on that point. Whether we agree on the underlying analysis is, is interesting. So, for example, uh, two, let's, let's take full-time male workers as, a, as an analytical baseline. Two big things have happened in the past half century. First of all, the surge of women into the paid workforce, that is domestic competition. And secondly, the creation of what amounts to a global labor market, which did not exist until the collapse of communism, the fall of the Berlin Wall, and the entrance of China fully into the global economy. I think we have not yet begun to think through how, can, how countries like the United States can respond to economic, huge tectonic economic forces like that, and uh, I don't think those responses are going to look a lot like the 1990s, my favorite decade, or the 1980s, presumably the favorite decade of a lot of the people in this room. Okay, let's, let's get another uh, question and over here, please. Um, thank you, gentlemen, for uh, participating today, and this kind of follows the, the first question is, 
um, if the left is in an inexorable movement to, to socialism, um, you know the, the phrase of uh, something about the definition of lunacy is doing the same thing and expecting a different result. How do socialists on the left uh, expect a different result from every um, instance we've seen of socialism, i.e. the Soviet Union and, and its demise and, and Venezuela's you know, sinking into a, a pit of, uh, if I would to quote my uh, president, a, a shithole. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, to put it as simply as possible, I can make my answer very short. I do not see the Democratic Party as being on an ex inexorable path towards socialism. I see it as being in the middle of a debate as to how contemporary capitalism can be adjusted you know, so that the general welfare is better promoted than under the status quo. That's the real debate. That's the constitutional debate. What does the general welfare require in current circumstances? And, uh, and it will, the, answer, de the Democratic Party will never arrive at Jeremy Corbyn's solution. Never. Um, That's what the Blairite said <laughs> before it happened. I'm, I'm just trying to explain it, understand it. That's all. I just think it's a very fertile time. I, I, I think if you look at the rhetoric of Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, who were getting 40% together in the Wall Street Journal poll out today, higher with their combined vote than Biden's 30%, their rhetoric is explicitly socialist. Uh, their solutions clearly socialist. And uh, I think Bill's right. I don't think capitalism is going away anytime soon. But we're going to have a robust debate of the type uh, that I think even a few years ago would have been unimaginable. And I think a good part of the reason are, are, is what uh, 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 Andrew suggests. But let me, let me just offer a, a, a slightly more straightforward explanation. When we all got out of school, the presumption, at least in, in my world and what I saw when I came of age, was that there were limitless possibilities. Tuition was cheap, health care was a, a, available and affordable through private means, or even if you paid yourself, didn't cost you much. Jobs were plentifully available, opportunities for advancement clear, and that's all disappeared. And uh, I, I see lots of young people running a business as I think the only full-time capitalist on this panel. And the degree of um, uncertainty that I see and the degree of desperation that I see of people with loans they can't pay for jobs they are unable to procure in a society that does not offer upward mobility, uh, as Bill suggested, I think gives rise to a level of frustration that uh, goes well beyond going to constitutional uh, principles and raises real issues of anger, frustration, and bitterness in a country with changing demographics, with a population that is restive in ways that we had never an anticipated, see mass incarceration, the new civil rights movement. Also notice that the person who ran as the candidate, the president for the Republican Party last time, uh, was in favor of all the entitlements actually going up, <laughs> told people they could have free health care that would be cheap. Um, he just had some answer to it. He ran, I mean, he was lying the entire time, but he ran on a far more progressive platform <laughs> that, and also in, uh, against free trade than any previous Republican ever had. Um, so if the Republican Party has turned that left uh, on economics, what do you expect the Democratic Party to do? Um, now, it's obscured because uh, the Republican Party right now is just this cult. Uh, but beneath, and, and because in, in power, the Republican Party did uh, the reverse. It actually intensified social inequality and intensified climate change deliberately. Kind of mind-blowing. Um, 
in the politics of it, they definitely, they definitely tack left this time. Mm. Okay, next question, please. Thank you. Um, I grew up uh, in high school and college in the early 70s. And when I was in school, um, there was a huge leftist movement going on at the time, uh, anti-war, anti-Vietnam. Youth, the baby boomers, were the largest generation to come forward. And everyone predicted a seismic shift in politics to the left. I recall the election of 1972 with a fairly unpopular Richard Nixon in the press and uh, in the, in, among the colleges in the elite. And I remember a professor from, of history from Wisconsin, George McGovern, being the vaunted uh, savior in income equality and income guarantees, being a substantial part of his platform as well as being um, what, what in fact he was promoting. Now I see Elizabeth Warren, I see Bernie Sanders, and I see Donald Trump. And your projection, um, Andrew, about the inevitability of the millennials turning left reminds me of another Tory, Winston Churchill, and his comment about those in their youth not being left versus those as they come of age not being right. I don't see the inevitability of the millennial generation and the successive Z, Z generation remaining left. I think the reality is that conservative nationalism is a progression that is bringing great results in this country. How do you address the historical paradigm? Well, Nixon didn't govern as a right winger, that's for sure. If you look at his record, many of us on the left, when you strip out Watergate and you strip out the unpleasant uh, nature of much of what Nixon uh, said uh, would be very happy with uh, a economic and social record that was quite moderate, hence his 49 state victory. And uh, I, I would just ask you to turn your clock a little forward to the 74 election when there was a sea change and even to 76 when Jimmy Carter uh, was elected as a Southern governor promising he would never lie to us. Now, I'm not suggesting that Jimmy Carter represents what we in the Democratic Party stand for. He most assuredly does not. But there was a dramatic reaction in the 70s against what um, uh, uh, the Nixon presidency produced. And indeed, because Nixon governed as a centrist, we ended up in 1980 with a continuation of a movement in the Republican Party started by Barry Goldwater uh, to, the, uh, to the right. You had Proposition 13 in 1978, and you had the nomination and election of Ronald Reagan in 1980. So as I see the history, I see it quite different than you do, but I would also tell you that it's gonna be pretty hard for me as I look at the poll data and see the millennials two to one left, also with no, no, no strength of their democratic allegiance. A lot of them call themselves independents, not because they're really independent, but because they're not aligned with any of the two major parties. So I think if you just try to believe that uh, political nationalism of the type Trump is pushing is gonna command a majority of the millennials, uh, I think you're um, overstating the case. And l let me add one other thing, that, that for the first time, uh, the Republican Party now stands for massive borrowing. Uh, that the one thing that socialism was always about, as Margaret Thatcher said, was spending other people's money. But there has never been a president who has spent other people's money quite as wantonly as the current one. Now, it's perfectly <laughs> massive amounts of spending and huge tax cuts to the super wealthy. Uh, that's, that's what he's done. Uh, when you have said, it doesn't matter what the budget deficit is, we can run a trillion, dollars, a, a trillion dollar deficit every year and we know the Republican Party will still cheer us, uh, of course there's an opening on the left to say, well, if there's all that money around that you just found, even though we were massively in debt when you came to office and we were in a period of growth and you still borrowed 
all that money to throw at the economy, why can't you, and you, just for the very wealthy, why can't you do it for the poor? Why can't you do it for the working classes? That's mm -hmm. such a powerful argument. And I think that the Republicans have completely ceded the party of responsibility, as it were, the party of we can't afford that, the policy of the party of no, we have to have limits. That is not the current Republican Party. Yeah. Actually, it hasn't been for a very long time. Let me, you know, since Andrew and I have disagreed on some points, let me agree emphatically with him on the point that he just made. Uh, and here, here is the bill of particulars. Uh, I think we all remember then candidate Donald Trump's famous down the escalator uh, announcement speech, at least we remember what he said about Mexicans, at least I do. Uh, what we forget is something that he said later in the announcement speech, and you can check it for yourselves, namely that we have to save Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid without cuts, I quote. And then he went on to say, we got to do it. Uh, and uh, the, an important part of the meaning of Donald Trump's nomination and election was the direct repudiation of the economic and fiscal parties of policies of the previous leader of the Republican Party, namely Paul Ryan. Right? Trumpism on economics is the rejection of Ryanism on entitlements, on the budget deficit, and on trade. Uh, and you know, and that move in the Republican Party has fundamentally reshaped the terrain of American politics and the competition between the two parties. And I think we're just beginning to work through the implications of that. Whether we can, whether we can live with economic policies that are indifferent to the sorts of things that Paul Ryan was trying to do something about is another question altogether, but that's where we are. Okay. Uh, we have next time question, for please. one more question. Hi, thank you for this very interesting debate. I did not go to Hillsdale College. We support Hillsdale. I am probably the last person that should get up and talk about politics, so I will not. The title of this conference this today was The Future of the Democratic Party. I have heard the word Marxism. I hear the word socialism. I agree with you, sir. There has been no one of the 27,000 Democratic people that are up there talking about a platform that I learned back in somewhat, I think, my younger years. So I ask you, if you're going to end this, Tell me, is socialism for the Democratic Party the future? And is that socialism defined? Because that also can be, when it's on steroids, communism. And that is something we fought for years to rid ourselves of. So I ask you, with your intelligence, your study, and your backgrounds, what is the future of the Democratic Party? Well. Uh, I'll, I'll take a shot at that quickly. I think we are going to see the advocacy of socialist policies by the Democrats, by their left wing, by the squad, by Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, continue unabated through this election, whether we win, lose, or draw. I don't think that we're going to be a communist society. I think there's very little chance of that though I didn't think Venezuela was going to end up with Maduro either, though I see no evidence that his cronies will do anything but uh, end up in our federal penitentiaries where many of them belong for drug trafficking. That being said, capitalism isn't going away here. I think Bill's largely right that it will face challenges and survive. My point is only those challenges are going to be more pronounced, more continual, and more vexatious than I think most Democrats, and certainly this Democrat, would like to see. I don't think I would call the proposals of, say, Elizabeth Warren, socialism. Um, uh, and this is why. Um, uh, do you think Margaret Thatcher was a socialist? She presided over free health care, 
for absolutely everyone and defended it through a socialist delivery system for three terms. Uh, was Britain socialist under Margaret Thatcher? I don't think so. Is, is, is public availability of health care popular? Hugely popular. Uh, what is Boris Johnson doing now? Promising to spend millions and millions and millions of dollars on the health care system so that everyone can have access to health care. Universal access to health care is not socialism. It's, 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 uh, it has been the foundation of every other Western society. Um, so, but I do think that it will become more I, redistribu redistributionist, um, and I do think it's going to become more leftist, and I do think it's going to culturally, uh, because the right has done such a terrible job of engaging the next generations, is going to be uh, much more culturally and socially to the left than we've ever seen before. Well, I guess leave, leaves it to me to, to end this discussion. Uh, I think I've been pretty clear that I don't think that the future of the country is socialist, let alone communist, and I don't think the future of the Democratic Party is that either. Uh, what we are going through right now within the party and within the country is an effort, and I think this is what our party system is all about, to struggle with very real public problems. Uh, if, you know, if the economy is not working well for everybody, and by the way, if it had been working well for everybody, Donald Trump would never have been elected president of the United States. He represented a response uh, to, you know, the failure of the country over a period of decades under Republican and Democratic presidents to deal with the problems afflicting the manufacturing sector of the country, to deal with the problems of rural America, the absence of capital for investment in those areas, et cetera. He represented one response to a very uneven economic terrain. And the Democrats are now wrestling about what their response to the same set of problems should be. We will not end up with socialism on the left. We will not end up with fascism on the right. Uh, but within 10 years, I think we will see very significant adjustments to the market system, a uh, much more aggressive antitrust policy. Yes, I agree with Andrew. More emphasis on redistribution for those people who are working full time and not making it in today's economy. Uh, we are likely to see uh, a real adjustment uh, of finance for higher education, uh, which is now in trouble because in response to the financial crisis, virtually every state responded with huge cuts in subsidies to higher education, shifting those burdens to students and their families. Those are the real debates we're going to have. And, you know, and I think that uh, hundreds of years of betters have gone broke betting against the, the capacity of the United States to assess and, as Winston Churchill put it, when all other alternatives are exhausted to do the right thing. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. So we're going to reconvene at 10.30. Uh, so, uh, Please uh, enjoy a break in the interim and uh, join me in thanking these gentlemen for uh, giving us some very good things to think about. <laughs>